situation. Uh, since we're broadcasting on 95.9, there are a lot of people parked outside and they've, they've stretched all the way to Main Street and to the bank parking lot and to the farmer's market. And so to take attendance, we have to go all the way around that block. And, and it's even gone as far as it's kind of like you all claiming your own pew because somebody got in the parking space for somebody that was parking in front of the Wells Fargo Bank to hear the... Uh, to, to hear the service, and they got huffy and said, I'm sorry, you're in my pew, so you've got to be careful. Come on down, Sister Sands. I appreciate them coming down the front pew there, our placeholder. Be on the radio. <laughs> and uh, if you're listening by radio, Terry's holding up the sign that says honk again because she liked that last week. Uh-oh, horns are frozen up this morning. Now, we also, if you did me a favor this morning, we have a chirp coming from somewhere that we have not been able to find. We suspect it's a fire alarm backup battery. So if you hear chirping as you go through the church, it's not a bat and it's not a bird. So please help us find that so we can change that battery. I'll put you to work today. Uh, don't forget that you can exit through either of these side doors and the ushers will direct you. The video will be edited and on the uh, website Wednesday, but you can also get information from Facebook and YouTube. So that's how we're communicating extra these days. Um, don't forget, today is the last day of the crop walk for Southwest Virginia. If you're planning on participating in that, try to finish up your walk today so you can inform them of your progress. And we're still working on the video team. Uh, we're preparing a request for the whole fund to get some equipment so that we can do a better job of streaming live as we're having these services. And so we need some people to you know, watch one camera and that would be our only function. So uh, it's not an uh, insurmountable job, but we'd like to encourage you to consider being on that video team. Uh, Ginger is here again at the back door. You saw her this morning and she's in charge of Halloween Madness on uh, Main Street, two Saturday, not next Saturday, but the following. So if you'd like to donate some candy or help her with that, she'd be glad to have you. And she's going to be doing publicity for youth and children's ministries from our church here. So keep that in your prayers. The prayer bus has not been anywhere for a week or 10 days. And if you have a suggestion on where as a place, uh, a group that we might let them know that this church is praying for, we're taking nominations for the next location to place the uh, prayer bus. So let us know. And food pantry is this coming week. 
Um, so we always need volunteers for that. It is the number of clients being served is starting to creep back up as the fall season comes in and uh, people need more help. So be aware of that and help us if you can. And we'd like to make sure that you realize that the committees of the church continue their work and the finance and the staff parish committees uh, met this last week to take care of some business on your behalf. So thank you for supporting them. Uh, are there other things that you know we should share with the entire congregation and maybe our friends listening by radio? It's a relatively calm day today, so, except for me messing up the preacher's lecture here. Our prayer request. Uh, we have uh, been asked to pray for Brother Bayard Barton. He had his surgery this week, and so we hope things are going well. Walter Sprinkle continues his treatments, uh, but he was up and about this week checking the cattle. Jeff Lambert and Tammy are still on our prayer list. Our government officials that are having problems with the COVID. Brother Don Hayes, Gerald's brother, over at the nursing home. Uh, Dawn Holly, Brian Walker's mother. Judy and Bob Lawrence, Brandy and Stephen Demet, Claire Root, Tissy Greer still recovering from her hip injury. Chris Offenberg's on the back. No, nope, she moved to the side pew. Chris, you've been on our list for a while. We continue to pray for you. Dina Landers and Brother Joe Tate. And let's see if there's somebody on this list. I got two this morning. Wendy and Jerry Howell. Jerry Hall has not been able to have his surgery yet, but he's still trying to get it scheduled. And Shirley Lockhart is still recovering from her broken foot. Are there others that you would add to this list? Yes, Joy? Brother Stephen Whitworth has sepsis. He's, he's been treated twice a day for 12 days oh. and was in the hospital for a week being treated. Sepsis, okay. So he's, he sent us thank you for helping him heal up from the last episode, and now we put him back on the list for a new thing. We're here all the time. I just want to praise that Kyle made it through COVID okay, and he's back at King. Oh, Kyle Robinson had COVID. I, we didn't even know that. Mama looks a little bit relieved even with her mask on. So thank you because Kyle helps us over the video audio board and we hope to rope him into more in the future. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, help me, help me. Granny Wise, all I know her as. Could you give us a real name? Gladys. Well, Gladys up in Benton, Virginia. Uh, she's been having a lot of issues with eye and other things. And uh, so... Joyce goes up and helps her a lot, and we pray for Gladys. Yes, Anna? Maybe it's, say it again. Oh, oh. Brian Underwood's mother had a fall. Oh, she's a relative of yours, or by marriage or whatever. Yes, I've been with them. Let's keep Brian Underwood's mom in your prayers. All right. Very good. Thank y'all for doing that. Are there any others? Uh, let's see. What's next on the agenda? Some more beautiful music from Brother Jim.
Good morning. I turned off the mic when I went to not turn it off. Um, you know, two things. One, I did mention that I would ask that you would uh, keep Tammy and I in your prayers. We are the parents of a very, very precocious three-year-old. Enough said. Those of you that have experience with three-year-olds, okay. Uh, and also, I am so excited about the, the prospect of, of our media ministry and video and uh, those that are, are tuning in via a radio at the transmitter this morning. Uh, I've always thought it would be neat to be on the radio and TV. One time, uh, someone asked me, said, well, so you want to be on TV and, uh, like Jimmy Swagger? <laughs> I said, oh, no. Uh, hopefully, if uh, anything video and radio comes through, it's in the spirit of Billy Graham. And so uh, I'm excited about that prospect. And a lot of folks think, well, gosh, you know, ministry is just tapered off and slowed down. And, uh, the old joke my dad used to say, well, you know, son, you have a job where you only work one day a week. Um, and that is so not true. You know, things like meetings here, uh, different gatherings here uh, that we were so accustomed to, uh, yeah, those, those things have changed and shifted, and we're not, we're not doing those at present. Uh, we're easing back into those. But I'll tell you, uh, and I think the, the staff and some other folks would echo this, uh, I've been working harder now since March than I've been working before then. Uh, and I thought uh, pastors and church staff had a, a pretty busy, hectic job to begin with. Well, it's, it's, more so, it's more so now. But the exciting thing about that, what, what makes feeling tired feel so good, is that the reach that we've had has expanded. Uh, through Facebook, to YouTube, the fact that people drive up and, and hear it on the transmitter, in our part of things. I mean, this, there's a real exciting opportunity through what we're doing with media. And I hope that that will be taken to your heart uh, as we continue to do ministry. Ministry is done in a different way. Uh, and it's done in a, in a challenging way. But oh my goodness, the reach is there. The reach is greater. Ministry is happening. We're just discovering that it's happening in new ways. Uh, which, you know, uh, provokes us all to think about uh, how we're giving and contributing to that, not only financially, the various ways that we have to give through bank draft, through online giving, uh, that we have on our website, through uh, sending a check to the church, dropping a check by but also with our time and with our willingness to step forward and say, hey, I'm going to be a part of that. There are opportunities. There are ways to, to connect and be involved that really say, hey, I'm, I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And it's all about making a difference and connecting people with Jesus. Our giving of our time, our giving of our gifts is so focused and centered on that very thing. And so when we give, when we say, here's my time, here's my finances, we are giving to that which God is using and making a difference. So let's let's give generously and give in that spirit. Let's let's have a prayer. God, as we as we share gifts this morning, as People dropped gifts in the offering place they came in as they're going to be giving this week. As folks are really thinking about their time and ways that they can be involved and connected, pray you bless each and every one for the, for the spirit of giving, for the spirit of stepping forward, for the, for the way of just simply we are seeking to be your people 
to serve you, to lift you up, to, to bring forward your mission. God, help us with all that. Help us in these days that are, are challenging, and you know oh so well. Just guide us so that we may be your people. In the name of your Son and for his sake, amen.
Amen. Amen. Just because we have masks on doesn't mean we can't say amen. 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 Because he lives, there's such truth in that hymn, such truth in the words of that song. Let us go more in prayer. Oh God, the truth of your word is profound. Because you live in, your, because your son lives, we do have hope. We can face the future. We can know there is no fear. No matter what is coming our way, before us, upon us, teeming and tossing within us. Because Jesus lives, there is such great, sweet, and wonderful hope. But oh God, we come this morning to praise you and thank you for being the God who loves, who sent your Son, who raised your son, who sent your spirit, who comes now and is coming again. God, we thank you for you bless us. You bless us with this time of worship this morning. You bless us with uh, so much. And so for all these blessings, big and medium and small, we thank you. We come asking for guidance and care and mercy and strength and comfort for those in our family and our midst, those that we're connected to who are just dealing with much, struggling with much, experiencing much. Pray, oh God, that you let your tender mercy just come to them, that they are eased of spirit and body and mind. And that in and through the, the kindness and care of others, through the good work and skill of the physicians and technicians and counselors and all who can give expertise, that just mercy flows. God, we come this day in the midst of a great time of unsettledness, seeking a word of hope that speaks to us and not makes us only hopeful, but hope-filled. We pray to you now the prayer your son taught us all as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, I've shared this with Jim that in the event that we need uh, that Jim is not available uh, I can play when the saints go marching in. <laughs> I took piano for one semester in seminary and that was the hymn that we were learning uh, to play the piano. However, I will say that the tempo at which I play it is quite a bit different than Jim. You heard how Jim plays it in that arrangement. Beautiful, wonderful. My version is kind of like dun, 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 dun. You get the idea. At the conclusion of that semester, the piano teacher was just, she was just so gracious. And I said, 
I mean, uh, I, I did fine until we got to Sharps and Flats, and now I said, well, how do you how do you feel about me uh, maybe taking uh, second section of piano? And as gracious and as kind as she was, she said, well, you know, there's a lot of other classes that the seminary offers that you can take in a semester. And so I, I took the gentle hint and well, that's the entire extent of my piano there. So, so if you want slow, plotting, and not very good, uh, you got it. So, this morning we're going to be looking at uh, Scripture. We're going to be looking at the work of the letter to the Hebrews. The Hebrews, uh, one of the, the finer works of the New Testament, such contains such wisdom and such encouragement. So we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 through 20. Uh, many Bibles will title this pericope, which is just a fancy word for passage. We'll title this passage, The Certainty of God's Promise. Hear this, the word of the Lord. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he had no one greater to whom to swear, by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently endured, obtained the promise. Human beings, of course, swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath given as confirmation puts an end to all dispute. In the same way, when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchanging character of his purpose, he guaranteed it by an oath. So that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible that God would prove be, would proven false, we who have taken refuge might strongly might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Well, God, indeed, uh, we are seekers of your word, seekers of a message of hope, and so in the service this morning, with our gathering the song Lord, we're explored with the presence of your spirit may that message of hope find a resting place in each and every one of us it's in your name and for your sake we pray amen hope Hope. It's, it's a word we use often. You know, I hope we win whatever the competition may be. I hope Bluebell has buttercrunch ice cream and say. I hope the next Batman movie they make is not silly. So far, so good. Hope. 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 It's a powerful word. What do you hope for? Do you have hope? Seems like it has been in short supply at times. Lately. What oxygen is to the lungs, hope is to the meaning of life, said Emil Bruner. 
Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness, said Desmond Tutu. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Each time a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripper, ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance, said Robert F. Kennedy. Tom Bonet. You know, keep the light on for you. So a person needs just three things to be truly happy in the world. Someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Over the years, I've been associated with scholarships, having served on some scholarship uh, committees to provide funding for a young person to pursue their education. That scholarship, when it is granted, whether it's $100 or $1,000 or $10,000, that scholarship is a means of hope, a tangible sign that that education can be obtained. Hope is sometimes the name of a child. You ever met a child named Hope? <laughs> the name Hope, you can share this with your daughter, Laura. The name Hope originally was used by Puritans. And it comes out in the top 1,000 names of children. It's been in the top for a name for a child every year. Except 1880. Don't know what about 1880. Maybe you can look that up and share it with me this week. But it is a popular name for a child. It, it's, it's a meaning. Uh, it means the feeling, feeling that a desire will be fulfilled. Hope. An appropriate name for a child, especially if that child has been longed for and waited for and now Arrives. It's a very perfect name. What do you hope for? What really sits deep within your heart? I hope, I, I long for it to be true. What is it that you, you hope comes to be? Aspire for its manifestation. What is it? Defined hope is an expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. It's, it's an aspiration, an aim, a wish. We want something to be the case. We use the term in many ways. Their only hope is surgery. He does seem to have some hope for the future. And who doesn't want a life filled with hope? Well, you know, she's hoping for a job offer. Now, uh, we do well to consider what is hope from a biblical point of view. Biblical hope is not, I hope my team wins the Super Bowl. I hope I get a raise. Biblical hope is not a hope so, but biblical hope is a no so. Not hope so, no so. In the Bible, it isn't waiting to see what happens in hope. It's not a feeling or an emotion. Hope is understood as a knowledge of the facts. 
If someone says to you, I hope you have a good day, there's no, there's no guarantee that the day will go well. But from a biblical point of view, it's to have a sure anchor of the soul. Hope is solid, concrete evidence because it is grounded in the Word of God. We trust that the Word of God is true. It's not a hope so, it's a no so kind of hope. There's a couple of key stories from, from Scripture about hope. Think of the woman caught in adultery. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and then placing her in the midst of their angry crowd, they said to Jesus, the law of Moses commanded us to stone, commands us to stone such women. What do you say? But Jesus knew they were only trying to trap him so charges could be placed against him. He knew their hearts. Jesus seemed to ignore the trap and wrote something in the dirt. And what he wrote has been long debated through the centuries. He said to them, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And when they heard it, one by one, the stones dropped, and they all went away. After they were gone, Jesus said, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The hope that is here, the hope that comes from that is that even if we are caught in a serious sin, and even in a time of public shame and humiliation, the hope is that there is room for forgiveness, room for reconciliation. That account is a beautiful picture of God's mercy and forgiveness. We don't lose hope because we're caught in a serious sin. We know, we know there is no greater sin. No greater sin that can outdo the grace of Jesus. Another account from Scripture. Jesus told the disciples that on the night that he was going to be betrayed, he would be delivered into the hands of his enemies and he would be put to death. And he told them that all of them would fall away and scatter. And Peter said, Not me. I will never fall away. But Jesus said, Peter, I tell you, before the sun comes up, you will deny me three times. And with some familiarity with the story, Jesus is arrested, and the disciples scatter, and before the sun comes up, before the rooster crows, Peter says, no, I don't know Jesus. He does it three times. <clears throat> the message of, of hope we get from that, from that account, is that if pride ever causes us to fall, like it has me and most everyone else, we remember that there is restoration before God. Jesus restored and forgave the Apostle Peter and later used him in a very, very powerful way. God does the same with us. That's not a hope so. It's a no so. Hebrews, in Hebrews, Abraham is shown to be 
an example of one who inherited the promises. The promise given to him that his offspring would be a, a great nation. God's promises are guaranteed by the fact of God's character. So, Abraham is promised to be a great nation. God promises in Jesus to save. That promise is secure. That promise is certain. Now, for Abraham, the promise was made manifest in his son Isaac. Abraham did not live to see his offspring be more than they, they would count. But we have, as we understand, we know from God's word, we have an anchor for the soul, the saving work of Jesus on the cross. The curtain referred to is the veil of the tabernacle separating the inner place, most likely of all places, the most holy of all places in the tabernacle. Jesus opened that veil, pulled it back, in fact, ripped it and allows all to draw near. Because of God's character, because of God's character, the action comes from His character. We are certain that what God has said and what God has done, especially in Jesus, this means that there is hope now and later, a life with God, a life with Jesus. You know, pastors, uh, every once in a while, they hear stories that just, they're passed around and, and they just have this unbelievable quality to them that if you didn't know they were being shared uh, as true and the people who were sharing them were sharing them and, and they were above board you, and, and you heard the story you would think oh there's oh no there's just no way that's too fantastic a story that can't be true you ever heard a story like that if you said well yeah yeah well you're going to add another to your list if, if you said, no, no, I've really never heard a story like that. Well, get ready because you're going to hear one just, just in a few minutes. As I said, the story that I'm going to share with you is true, even though when you hear it, you're going to think, no, that's not true. Uh, the story is set around Christmas, a time of year that really opens many people up to wonder to really be open to receive the greatest miracle. But then Easter is also a similar time of year when it causes us to wonder about the greatest event that could ever take place, which is the resurrection. But this is Christmas. And a young pastor and his wife have taken over a church in an unknown River Valley town. It's away from the city. Small town. One stormy December night, it was, it was raining. And the, the church just got drenched, got soaked. And it caused a chunk of the wall right behind the altar to fall out. Okay. We're in good shape. So, you know, every pastor loves it when some big uh, uh, calamity like that happens in the sanctuary around Christmas time. That's just joy. That was sarcasm, by the way. So, uh, so easy to get repairs and that work done around the holidays. Now, that afternoon, the couple attended an auction 
where there was this beautiful gold and ivory lace tablecloth that had been put on the auction block. I mean, it was, it was gorgeous. It was 15 foot long. And the pastor was inspired. Uh, and he made a bid of $6.50. That's what it was going for. And uh, he, he won the auction. And he took that tablecloth back to the church. And he said, you know, this is so beautiful. It will cover that section of the, of the wall that came out. And, and, you know, through the holidays, and it will be, look nice on the wall because it was just so beautiful. A tablecloth. Now, about noon on Christmas Eve, the pastor opened the church door and he noticed this elderly woman at the bus stop. He knew the bus wasn't going to come for 40 minutes, so he invited her in. It was very hospitable. She said she lived in the big city, but had come to town to interview for a nanny job with a local family, but she didn't get the job because of her imperfect English. The woman sat in the pew for a while and she offered a prayer. And then she noticed the, the pastor was straightening the, this big, large tablecloth behind the altar. And the woman got up and she walked forward and she went in disbelief. She said, it's mine. The pastor was a bit perplexed, and the woman then showed her the monogram, her monogram, on the tablecloth. She said, it's my banquet cloth. The woman explained how her Viennese husband had uh, the beautiful cloth made, and especially for her, in Brussels. She then went on to tell the pastor and his wife that, you know, life was good until the Nazis took over. And the day came when she let him put her on a train to travel to safety. She said he was supposed to follow with a few possessions, but he never came. And she said that later she had heard that he had died in a concentration camp. She told the pastor, she said, I deeply regret leaving him. The pastor thought, it doesn't matter about the wall. He tried to give her the tablecloth. You know, it was rightly hers. But she said, no, no. You keep it. And she left him at the church. Now, at Christmas Eve worship that night, the tablecloth caught the eye of a churchgoer. He was the town jeweler. He said, after the service, he said, you know, it, it's so strange, Pastor. Many, year ago, many years ago, my wife, God rest her soul, she and I, we owned such a tablecloth in our home in Vienna. My wife would only put it on the table when the pastor would come to dinner. When the pastor revealed the woman's visit earlier in the day, the man had to sit down. He said, can it, can it be that she's still alive? Together, the, man, the pastor and the man went to the local family to ask about the woman they interviewed. And later that night, the pastor and the town jeweler drove to the big city to find her home. And then, throughout the night, they looked. Then as Christmas Day came, the woman who had interviewed for the job and the town jeweler who had been separated, who had thought each other had died in the concentration camps, killed by the Nazis on that Christmas day. 
they were reunited. See, I told you it would be a story you would go, there's no way that's true. It's true. It's true. But what a reminder. What a reminder to each and every one of us that hope lives when we think it's gone. Because we don't feel that surge of hope within, that wish, that aim, that something is so, just because we don't feel it's the case, does not make hope any less real. It means we just don't feel it at that particular point in time. It might mean we're out of touch. Life can do that to a person. I, I've, I've been there. It might mean that we don't connect with that hope, that beautiful hope that God offers in Jesus Christ. Such a connection that offers that sense of hope is something that I look for. I mean, I don't want that feeling. And who doesn't? I can tell you there was a time when Dan and I were foster parents and Kayleen was in her care. And as often as the case with foster parenting, it's a roller coaster ride. And there was a time there was a time that we genuinely thought we were going to lose Katie. And the hope would have just kicked out of us. And it's a risk of being a foster parent. I mean, we knew that going in. having hope, we must seek, uh, discover, connect with that living hope, with that which is greater than ourselves. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well because the certainty Hope is not the conviction that things will turn out well, but the certainty that God is there no matter how things turn out. That is a really good word for these crazy, topsy-turvy days we've had. That no matter how something turns out, God is there. to us, no matter what journey or path we are tempted to take or choose to take or find ourselves on, not by choices of our own, and when we think hope is gone, 
hope is real. It's certain in God. It is certain because of Jesus' work. Not just on the cross, but because of Timothy. It's not a hope so. It's a no so. God, how wonderful and beautiful you are to give us a hope beyond any kind of reason, behind any kind of rationality, that when we think hope is gone, your hope, hope in you, is sound, sure, and true. May it be no so within each of us, no so within us, Family, no so to live and be and do in these days. It is in the name of your Son, and for his sake we do pray. Amen. Jim, lead us.
Michigan. Let us depart from this place knowing that we have not a hope so, but a no so experience with God that deep in God is a hope that no matter what, God is there. Go in the love of God the Father, the great teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the power of the communion of the Holy Spirit.